Hey, I'm really excited uh, to introduce Farb Nivy, who's the CEO of Grocket, or for those of you who've seen our sneak preview uh, videos, the guy that looks like he's auditioning for CSI. And without further ado, Farb, very excited. Thank you. My name is Farb Nivy. I'm the founder and CEO of Grocket, and I'd like to start by thanking everyone here at the conference. Um, I think this is the first one, right? But it seems like it's like the 10th or so. I think they've done a really awesome job, so thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to show you around Grocket a little bit just to let everyone know I'm wearing this cool like 26-year-old IBM Rome t-shirt when they made some connection after IBM bought them and I just thought I'd wear it because it's a pretty different style of engineering I think that was going on 26 years ago relative to what folks at this conference are doing. Uh, so before I jump into Agile, I'll just show you around Grocket a little bit. Grocket is a social network for studying. I actually jumped into a game yesterday really quickly and here are a couple of uh, students working with each other. And in fact, the first thing one student's saying is, I need help, can you please help me? So that's pretty much what Grocket is about, is students helping each other learn. Here's a picture of your profile. We're pretty crazy with statistics and analytics. And those are some sh sessions that a st student has worked before. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we've been doing agile software development, why we started doing agile customer development uh, through the sort of timeline of Grocket. Um, and, you know, I'm not the first to say this. I really couldn't even find the person that you know, said it originally. Uh, I looked all over the web. It's in a lot of agile stuff. Um, but, you know, software is primarily a human endeavor, right? And this isn't meant to sound sort of soft or touchy-feely. Uh, I think really the idea is that... Um, since you have a bunch of humans creating software, if your processes are designed with that in mind, you'll just get a hell of a lot more out of the people than you would um, if that wasn't the way you built your processes from the ground up. Uh, my background is in organizational psychology, uh, so this appealed to me uh, very much. So uh, what I'd like to do is sort of talk about Grocket um, through the timeline um, uh, of Grocket from before we started to down the road uh, and even why we're doing what we're doing uh, now. So uh, before we started, so um, when Grocket began, it was just an idea on paper. Uh, we didn't have any product, any users, any anything uh, when, we, when we did our first seed round. Uh, so we had to sort of pick a process, I guess, or you can go with the lack of a process, which is probably not a really good one to, to go with. So uh, we approached Pivotal Labs. Uh, you've probably heard of them if you're in the, into the world of Agile. Um, and uh, we adopted their process. So uh, the main reason that you know, we, we started doing Agile is because, well, it's Agile. And as a startup, you need to be able to go in any direction at any time. So from a business operations perspective, it just makes sense um, to have a software development practice <laughs> that can drop what it's doing one day and start doing something else on the next day uh, without it being too uh, chaotic, right? Uh, so your developers are going to get used to their work process um, and if that work process includes this idea that tomorrow everything may be different, uh, then it introduces a lot less chaos when tomorrow everything is different. Uh, so Agile, I think, really has that in mind in terms of your developer's worldview. Um, we practice paired coding, which is collaborative, just like Grocket. Um, and I think that speaks a lot to um, how Agile is part of creating what, I, you know, what is called a learning organization, which is an organization where the members are learning from each other, they're learning more together, uh, they're sharing. And in software development, uh, we, we call that, you know, uh, what is it, uh, co you know, um, collective code awareness, essentially. Uh, so that the expertise of one developer becomes the expertise of another developer. Uh, when we're hiring, uh, quite frankly, we don't care what software languages you know or whether or not we even use them. If you're a really bright developer, um, in a really short amount of time, you will be coding really productively in the languages that we use without any problem, and we've done that several times without any issues. Um, another reason Agile made sense for us before we started um, was we had a lot of unknowns. Like I said, Grocket was just an idea um, uh, of mine. <laughs> uh, we got funded uh, and we had to go to work. So the massive amount of unknowns uh, made Agile uh, a, a really attractive idea to us because we could you know, essentially get something out there immediately. And, and Grocket is a pretty large and complex in, in, you know, platform and environment. So um, 
inching our way towards it instead of spending you know, a year or two years designing um, before we really started coding uh, was our, our preference. Um, so like I said, we use Pivotal Tracker um, a, a, as well as having you know, really learned a lot of our discipline from Pivotal and, and, and modified it to make it work for us. And when I grabbed this screenshot, it happened to actually have my quotation <laughs> that is sometimes on their screen, uh, which is essentially, you know, I'll just read the last line, which is Tracker rings order from chaos, use it or stay in the dark ages. Um, I look at uh, Tracker as a collaborative GTD. Um, it is not a to-do list. Uh, it is a you know, series of stories that are invitations to have conversations. Uh, and part of the process of Agile for us is really being disciplined uh, about the process and, and, and trying to do it consistently. So learning to, to how to write a story um, becomes really important for us. Uh, and I think probably the adage, you know, this is just my little tips on, uh, on what's worked for us and what doesn't, um, is to really sort of think of things like a fictional writer, which, uh, you know, the adage in, in fictional writing is show, don't tell. Um, don't create, don't turn your tracker into a list of to-dos for your developers. Um, instead, it should be a narrative of the experience that you're trying to deliver to your users. Um, and when it's written that way, um, the mindset of the people that are writing the software is vastly different and they're able to problem solve and understand what you're trying to get out uh, a lot more effectively. So let's take a look at a couple examples. Um, at the top, there's two ways th to write this story. You could say, put a link to the products page on the user profile. So this is essentially is a command to the developer to go do this thing. Um, versus the version underneath it is that when a member views their profile page, they see a link to the product page styled per the mock-up. And you'll attach a little mock-up that shows where the link is. When your whole tracker, you know, when you have 30 stories listed for this uh, week's iteration, um, in the first style, it just reads as a list of to-dos and it's not a really engaging way to work for anybody. And it just creates so many more bugs, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Uh, there's a sort of a funny story that we have at Grokket about a feature that was essentially implemented in the exact inverse of what was intended <laughs> um, because uh, it wasn't written well, it wasn't communicated well. Stories are an invitation to have a conversation. Um, and that conversation should be starting uh, long before the developer is writing the code that day. That conversation is starting when you're try trying to start the developing the product. Um, that conversation continues when you get to the point where you're showing it to your developers um, and you're having a planning meeting uh, around uh, working on this, you know, five days from now. Um, the conversation continues when the developer is working on it. The conversation continues through QA, and the conversation continues to the user that's experiencing it through whether you're collecting data on their usage of it or you're actually talking with them directly. Um, so this conversation is ongoing, and Tracker is the tool that we use to sort of manage this conversation. Another quick example is send the sign-up email to everyone that signs up is written as a command versus when a member creates an account, they receive the sign-up email. So when it, you write it as a narrative, your tracker, your, 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 however you keep track of the stories that you have coming through, reads like a narrative. Uh, it's much easier to understand from a developer's perspective what is the desired user experience, uh, and it turns out you just end up with a lot fewer bugs. So um, I'm not an engineer, I'm a product guy, and uh, taking, uh, adopting Agile, you know, has done a, you know, I've never developed software in another process, so it's difficult to say. Um, but I know that at this point, after we've, you know, been doing this for a couple of years now, we're extremely productive. The connection between me and the engineers, we don't even have a VPE at Grokit yet. Um, we have a director of engineering. Um, I essentially play, uh, him and I essentially play the VPE role. Um, and if you're in that situation, I, I think it's an incredible way of interacting with an engineering department as a product person um, if you're also a non-technical founder uh, like myself. Um, Agile is a process, you can learn it. 
Uh, you can learn it from Pivotal Labs. You can learn it from great books written by the folks that have developed it. You can read it from uh, tons of great blog posts. You can read it by, you can learn it by coming to Grokit and hanging out for a bit and learning from us. Um, so this is a legitimate process. It's not just a bunch of rules of thumb uh, that you adopt. Uh, there are processes that you can learn and continue to get better at doing over time. Um, and the, the last big reason that we you know, chose Agile <clears throat> before we started is that it has a very user-centric uh, worldview, uh, and that's really what I wanted our developers and everyone on our team to have, is a user-centric uh, worldview. So when we started, we had about four developers, and our velocity, if you know how Tracker works, and its point system was about seven. I'll get to that a little bit more. Uh, so down the road a little bit, why did we keep using Agile? Well, agility. It turns out that aspect of it doesn't really go away. You don't ever want to really stop being able to do whatever you want whenever you need to do it. Um, the next one, written in all caps, is customer development. Um, I think um, for us, we adopted customer, de customer development practices um, when we were down the road, not before we started like we did with Agile software development practices. But ha having such a defined and disciplined practice like we had in Agile made it so much easier to adopt customer development processes as well as the worldview of customer development. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. <clears throat> Down the road, it reduced a lot of waste. So talking about you know, um, deploy time, uh, we took our test suite from about 55 minutes uh, to about under five minutes. Um, and the reason I say that equals days is that when your um, test suite is this long and your deploy process is this long and things end up taking a few hours to get out to uh, production or to staging um, or however you have your process, in the end, it just turns out that, well, we can't do it today because it's like eight o'clock at night and then we're going to just be here all day QAing this and if there's issues, let's just do it tomorrow. So when you get it down to like that sub 10 minute thing, that's when you can really start cranking it out whenever you want and it's not in the way at all. So that was really uh, a great thing that happened to us a little bit down the road. Um, I think this process makes hiring new engineers a lot easier. Uh, by pairing with them. Basically, when you want to apply to Grokit as an engineer, you come in, you spend several hours pairing with our developers, usually with our most senior ones, and at the end, I just ask the question, do you want to continue to pair with that person day in and day out? And they can pretty easily say yes or no. Um, and that person uh, is you know, evaluated on their ability to hang in the code with the other developers. Um, we want someone who, literally, when they walk in the door, uh, the experience is that they can hang in the code with you. Uh, it's not like they, at Grokit you don't sit down and just develop by yourself. You're almost always with somebody else. That's the process. So that's our interview process. Uh, there isn't a lot of, you know, there is some sitting down and chatting beforehand, but it's not two hours of talking in a conference room. Um, it's three, four hours of writing code together. Um, and that really gives the candidate the best way of understanding what life at Grokit is going to be like. So um, down the road, it made hiring, I think, a lot easier for us. Um, it also helped us weather the storms. So um, I spent, you know, about six months of last year in and out of the hospital uh, recovering. Uh, and I can pretty confidently say if that we didn't have the disciplined uh, process that we have, um, I don't think there'd be a grocket today. Um, I was actually literally able to work in Tracker from my hospital bed, uh, work in Tracker from my home when I was recovering. Um, I had my product, uh, uh, one of my product people, Matt Johnson, who's over there, you'll see him a little later, uh, coordinating with me on the phone on IM. Um, and Tracker kept us all tied together, and our processes around Agile um, really kept us uh, tied together through that. Um, we've also, you know, at that point, it was actually pretty rough. We lost a couple of developers, and that's another thing that uh, paired coding and I think Agile lets you uh, weather that type of storm as well. If you lose folks, um, e even one of our technical co-founders is um, still working for Grokit but not at Grokit anymore and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but even when you're losing s uh, really significant uh, parts of your team, uh, you can withstand that storm so much more effectively when your team is paired coding, when there's collective code awareness. Uh, it, 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 there's almost no burp. It, it, it's really amazing. Um, so to talk a bit about um, some of the challenges um, that we had to get through once we kind of got down the road with Agile, um, despite the fact that it's easier to hire, I think it's harder to find the right people. It's a specific style of uh, writing software that works for some people and doesn't work for others. Some people just don't want to do any paired coding. They just don't like working like that. 
you shouldn't hire those people if that's your practice. So you might have to look a little bit more, um, but the advantages that you get, stuff like being able to hire any super smart developer you come across, regardless of what languages they know, um, really overcome, I think, that, 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 that problem in sort of finding the right people. And then sometimes you'll find people that you think work, and they'll think that they like that process, and after they're around for a couple of months, they find that it's not right for them. That's not a problem. That doesn't say anything about them. That doesn't say anything about your process. There are lots of people out there. Uh, you, unless you need millions of developers, you should be able to find uh, enough people that really, really love this process, and love pairing, and, and, and love this way of working. Um, maintaining the practice becomes uh, an important issue. So lots of things that you have to keep on top of. We talked about keeping on top of, uh, on top of writing stories correctly. Uh, that's really important in terms of just everyone's worldview, keeping bugs to a minimum. But there's a lot more stuff. Uh, release planning. Uh, you got to make sure you keep doing that. Iteration planning, your stand-ups, product planning, story writing, pointing, making sure that you're on, uh, keeping consistent with how you point keeping consistent with who's prioritizing what and whose roles are what, keeping your releases small, keeping your deploy time small, keeping your test build time small, doing lots of split testing, make sure you're always doing you know, hacking, hacky like agile customer testing, and also making sure you're refactoring when there's a need to. So this is just like a starting list, and uh, this is my point that you know, agile is not a bunch of rules of thumb, it is a process with a decent amount of complexity, um, but once your team is doing it, it's actually actually very natural. You don't really think about these things, and they just all sort of happen in the process. Um, so let's talk a little bit about customer development. And so, like I said, we adopted that after uh, a little bit down the road. We were about a year into our company when we really uh, started getting uh, a lot more serious about customer development, uh, bringing Eric in, doing a lot of split testing. Uh, we brought on a, a whole employee just to essentially head that off um, with, with me and the company. And so this is my little analogy of customer development and why it's not maybe the most intuitive and easy thing to see. You know, so agile software development for us becomes, it became this like really powerful engine that could just crank us forward um, as fast and as quickly as we wanted. And you know, you as the founder or, or the product person, you're the rudder, right? You're making the decision of which way to, uh, to, to steer this ship in this you know, sea of users. Um, and customer development is kind of difficult to see, right? It's not the water. It's actually the feedback between the water, which is you know, all your users, and the rudder, which is you. And that's difficult to sort of see and can, can be difficult to conceptualize. Um, but it's that process of feedback that you get from the decisions you make and the decisions you make on how to steer yourself. Agile becomes this really, uh, software development becomes this really powerful engine that can help you plow forward really quickly. Um, but unless you have a feedback loop for you know, which direction you're heading, you're just kind of you know, flailing about. So customer development. Um, I like customer development because it validates your intuition when the data agrees with you and validates your wisdom in using data when it doesn't agree with you. So it's sort of a win-win situation, right? Um, if your intuition was wrong, you just get to say, oh, well, that's not a problem. I'm so wise, I use data to make my decisions. I don't just you know, pick something and go. So um, customer development, to me, just sort of makes sense from that perspective. Um, so talking about a few pieces of customer development, this is awfully small, let's zoom in here a little bit. So Agile is a process, um, and customer development is a process, um, and adding a process to a process is actually, I think, easier than adding a process to a non-process. Um, uh, Agile has a lot of defined pieces to it, um, and customer development uh, as a series of tools and stuff work very well with it, um, and also in terms of making it easier to adopt that worldview, it's, it's important. Um, and so Agile can be too much of a good thing, which is my point around um, you know, just having that sheer speed and being able to plow through things is not the ideal. Um, you want to actually be able to make smart decisions. Um, customer development actually reduces um, uh, internal friction, right? You have data to make decisions against, so there's less arguing. Um, and it also does what I call is reduce the customer annoyance fear index. So um, if you have a lot of employees that are really afraid of uh, annoying a customer. Um, it, it, it can reduce the friction of having those conversations by being like, well, we should be able to know from the data whether or not the customer is even coming back, which to me is the number one way someone's going to behave if you've really annoyed them too much. They're just not going to come back. 
Um, and customer development to me is big company tactics for the startup, and I'll talk about that uh, in a, a little bit as well. Um, so just to look at an example, um, Here's some data, you know, in terms of, you know, I call this an internal touchstone because, like I said, uh, you know, it, you might think it's annoying to get an email, but it turns out that once we ran this split test, this, you know, sent reminder email um, actually won, um, especially in the categories that, you know, we, we were actually thinking it would lose um, in terms of uh, annoying the customer. So um, by having this data, it just becomes the internal touchstone against which you can make your decisions and being like, we're not annoying the customers. Look, the, the ones that are getting the annoying email, they're coming back more and they they keep doing it, and they keep doing all the other things as well. Um, and then here's another example of the split test. I don't know why that's not going to zoom in on that a little bit. Um, skipping the upsell versus going to upsell, a little, another potentially sort of non-intuitive thing. You'd think that if you try and upsell people right up at the front, that's when they buy the most. Um, but it turned out that in this user flow, uh, totally skipping the upsell, going to the actual uh, application, letting folks use it, um, again, won out um, in the end. You see it's, it's, it's the bolded one. Um, so I know I have a couple minutes here. I'm going to get through this last piece real quickly. So how are Agile working for us today? Like I said, it's Agile. We still like being Agile. Um, one of our technical co-founders now is in Puerto Rico. He still is working on Grok and stuff. Um, and it's almost like seamless and the easiest thing out there. Um, and it's entirely because our process is super disciplined. He's been around since the beginning, so he knows the process super well. Uh, and we can work really seamlessly with him like so far away. Um, we went from four developers to nine developers and our velocity went from 7 to 30. Um, and I've been here from the beginning, so I have a pretty good sense of um, you know, what our stories cost at the beginning and what they cost now, and it's not just massive point inflation. And it actually coincides with my own uh, sense of like, how much work we're really able to accomplish now. Um, am I pretty much done? All right. Um, so just real quickly... Um, if there's any, uh, uh, the, the challenges that we have now really, I think, are, are, are scaling this practice um, and continu continuing to do it as the company grows. Um, I think it's entirely possible, um, but, you know, we'll see. Um, and that's pretty much, uh, this is a quick graph of our velocity and tracker. Um, and that's uh, pretty much my speech. Thank you very much.